Here's what I think is the most effective peck popping deltoid destruction arm annihilation push day I've ever designed using scientific principles. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here today, PhD in sports science with Wolf Coaching, non functional sign, but we stay working, we stay paying those bills until I can finally afford to get it fixed. While the sign isn't fixed yet, I'm going to fix your mess of a push day. You see, some commenters have been saying, stop repeating the same thing every single time you explain how to structure a perfect push day, a perfect pull day, or what have you. Just stop. Just stop it. Stop. No, it's just stop it. To that I say, I would, but you keep making the same mistakes. I see your programming, I see your train, and I can tell you it's not ideal, it can be improved. And here's why. A good push day is designed to fit within your program. The best push day doesn't do a thing if you do it once every two weeks, or if you do it every day. Sorry, Dr. Pack, but I do think you still need to train your legs. So this perfect push day is designed to be repeated twice a week with some minor modification. This push day will have a slight chest emphasis. The second push day should have a slight triceps or shoulder emphasis to kind of balance things out. Alternatively, you could just create two push sessions that both similarly emphasize the chest, triceps, delts, etc. Importantly, within your push-pull legs routine, your push days will generally be the easiest. Then your pull days are hardish, and your leg days are difficult. So if there are any muscle groups you're not quite sure whether you should fit them into a pull day or a push day, I would generally recommend to fit them within your push day. After all, your push sessions just tend to be easier, so that's where you can add more stuff without it necessarily becoming a super difficult session. A hallmark of any good training session for hypertrophy is that it limits redundancy. The reason that low volume programs can actually work reasonably well for hypertrophy is because your first few sets in a given training session or a given training week have the biggest impact on hypertrophy. Then as you add more and more volume, you get diminishing returns in how much hypertrophy that causes. So within a given training session, we don't just want to target one muscle group because we get diminishing returns on each additional set for that one muscle. That's partly why body part splits probably aren't ideal for hypertrophy. The main thing is that we don't want to do a ton of work for just one or two muscles at the expense of other muscle groups. For example, doing the barbell bench press, followed by the flat dumbbell press, followed by some sort of flat chest press. It's gonna be great for your lower chest, but what about your triceps, long head for example, or your front delts, or even your upper chest? Those aren't really being targeted that well. So we want to limit redundancy in terms of the exercise selection. Next, we want to make sure we're using maximally effective rep ranges. Here's the deal. For hypertrophy, based on a paper by Schoenfeld and colleagues, the maximally effective rep range for muscle building is between five reps per set and 50 reps per set. However, we'll be mostly sticking to sets of five to 15 reps for practicality reasons. Based on some of the research I've been involved in, it turns out most people are accurate at gauging how close to failure they are when they're working between five and 12 reps for the most part. Once you go above this, people become less accurate. That being said, there is potentially a benefit to be had in terms of overall muscle growth by combining different rep ranges for most muscle groups, most training weeks. And so we won't just stick in the five to 12 or five to 15 rep range. We'll also include some higher rep work. And finally, we'll make sure to match the right rep range to the right exercise. Let's say you wanted to train your front delts and today was your light day for front delts, meaning you were doing high reps. If you were about to do sets of 20 to 30 reps on standing barbell overhead press, you may not have a great time. Other muscle groups may give out first, you may get so out of breath that you end the set prematurely, your front delts aren't getting the best stimulus. And so matching the right rep range to the right exercise is another thing we'll be focusing on. Next, we'll make sure to use a maximally effective volume. Because this push session is designed to be repeated twice a week within a six day push pull legs approach, we'll try to aim for five to 15 sets per muscle per session here. So that then when repeated twice a week, we get to a range of around 10 to 30 sets per week per muscle. While 10 to 20 sets per week per muscle is a great place to grow, there is some research. We now have eight studies comparing volumes of over 20 sets per week per muscle to volumes of under 20 sets per week per muscle, showing that there might be a benefit to going over 20 sets per week per muscle. It's probably not a huge benefit as four studies have found broadly no difference and four studies have found a benefit, but it's worth considering if we're maximizing that their hypertrophy. Next, we'll want to train sufficiently close to failure to maximize hypertrophy. There's a few things this means. One, a meta regression by Robinson and colleagues found that the closer a set was taken to failure, the more hypertrophy it caused, all else being equal. 
However, training too close to failure can cause more fatigue. A recent study by Rafao and colleagues, for example, compared training to one to two reps in reserve to training all the way to failure. And even after eight weeks of training all the way to failure, training to failure still caused a greater drop off in repetition performance from set one to the last set. So it seems that training to failure does cause more fatigue. And so I think we should reserve training to failure for the last set of an exercise. That way we get to maintain performance to a greater extent, but also get the benefit of training pretty close to failure and even to failure for that last set. Basically reserve failure or training super close to failure for when it won't harm you on the last exercise for a muscle group on a given day, and on the last set for that exercise generally. Next, we'll want to pick maximally effective exercises for each muscle group. There's a few things that go into this, and I have a whole series on the topic you can check out somewhere above, but there's a few things to look out for. First, the exercises we pick need to target one of the primary functions of the target muscle. For our push day, that's gonna be a few functions. Shoulder horizontal adduction for the pecs, shoulder abduction for the side belts, shoulder flexion for the front delts, and elbow extension for the triceps. Next, the target muscle should be the limiting factor. The only study we have on chest growth is a study by Chavez and colleagues that compared a 45 degree Smith machine press to a flat Smith machine press, finding greater upper chest growth from the 45 degree incline chest press compared to the flat chest press. And when it came to the lower chest, there were no differences. Suggesting that all else being equal, the incline press is a slightly better all around chest exercise compared to the flat press. Next, the exercises we pick should be stretch friendly, AKA put the target muscle into its stretch position, have sufficient tension in that position and be length and partial friendly. We have a few studies in the tricep specifically, a study by Godo and colleagues looking at the skull crusher, a study by Mayo and colleagues looking at the push down which is the overhead extension, and a second study by Stasinaki and colleagues also looking at the push down overhead extension. These three studies, by and large, do support the idea that training at lower muscle lengths is likely beneficial for building the triceps, for example. And finally, where possible, we'll want to minimize involvement of other muscle groups and spinal loading. If we can sit down or lie down as opposed to standing, probably a good thing. Reduces the involvement of stabilizing muscle groups, reduces potential fatigue, and makes sure that the target muscle is more likely to be a limiting factor. If you're someone who's pressed for time, you may also want to consider how time efficient the exercise is. Dumbbell and stack loaded machines are generally more time efficient than barbells. Next, we'll want to pick maximally effective rest times between each set. A recently pre-printed meta-analysis by Singer and colleagues that I was actually a co-author on and extracted all the study's data for suggests that between 60 to 120 seconds of rest between sets is very effective, and in fact, might be maximally effective. So when it comes to training for push days, I would say that around 60 seconds of rest between isolation movement sets and around 90 seconds of rest between compound pushing exercises is going to be great. Next, we want to pick a really effective exercise order. Now that you have your exercises together, how many reps you're doing, how long you're resting between sets, we want to make sure we order the exercises in the best way possible. Now, the impact of exercise order on hypertrophy is unlikely to be all that large. In fact, a meta-analysis by Nunes and colleagues found no effect, essentially, of exercise order on hypertrophy. However, fortunately for us, there is a study on the effect of exercise order within a push session on hypertrophy. And that's a study by Randall and colleagues, where they compared a variety of things, but one of the things they looked at was the effect of either starting with a bench followed by the school crusher or starting with a school crusher followed by the bench. And when measuring hypertrophy of the triceps and the pec muscle, they generally found notably better pec growth from starting with a bench followed by the school crusher and actually marginally better tricep growth with the same exercise order of starting with the compound movement followed by the isolation movement. And in general, although it probably doesn't play a huge role, there are a few principles I like to follow with exercise order. Specifically, start with compound movements first and then isolation movements. Generally, order exercises in a way that maximizes performance across the session. If you start with skull crushers and you find your bench press takes a huge hit, but the other way around, skull crushers don't take a hit, that second order is likely beneficial. And finally, if there are any muscle groups you really want to bring up in terms of hypertrophy, you may want to start with them earlier in the session when you're freshest and are able to give them the most attention. The final factor that goes into a really effective push day or any session really is good technique on all exercises. Our recent narrative review paper on this identified three things from the evidence to focus on. First, tempo. There's kind of a sweet spot between around two seconds per rep and around eight seconds per rep 
that will maximize hypertrophy. Based on much less data, there might be a case to be made for controlling the eccentric for about one to two seconds at least and being a bit more explosive on the concentric or lifting phase. Additionally, we might want to control the eccentric and pause a bit more in that stretch position. And that brings me to range of motion. The main thing to focus on as far as range of motion during a movement for hypertrophy is to emphasize and include the stretch position. Whether you do that by doing full range of motion or length and partials probably doesn't matter a huge amount. But some evidence suggests that length and partials might lead to more growth compared to a full range of motion. And finally, minimizing body English or the involvement of other muscle groups. By involving other muscle groups and cheating the weight up on any exercise, you're potentially causing greater fatigue and stabilizing muscle groups, reducing the likelihood of the target muscle being a limiting factor, and therefore theoretically, although we don't have any direct studies on this, it probably reduces hypertrophy stimulus. All right, big science man, I hear you saying, I've heard this a few times before, and why you've told me about cool new studies. And really, this video was just a thinly disguised vehicle for you to teach me about science. What about the push day? Give me the push day, you fuck. Without further ado, here is the ultimate push day with a slight chest bias. First, we'll start with an incline press variation to target the upper chest specifically, but also just give you a good front delt stimulus and a good lower chest stimulus and a good tricep stimulus for your lateral and medial head. You could do the 45 degree incline dumbbell press. You could use the Smith machine instead with the same incline. You could use a camera board or you could even use any nice incline press machine. You have a few options here but I think you should perform three to five sets of five to 10 reps with about 90 seconds of rest, taking the first set to three reps in reserve and the last set to one rep in reserve. Which of these exercises should you pick specifically? In my opinion, pick whichever variation allows you to get the best stretch. If you have a prime incline press machine, that can be phenomenal. If you find you're able to get a full stretch, even just with an incline dumbbell press, then that's a totally fine option as well, and it's super time efficient. But because all of the exercises I mentioned do a pretty good job as far as hypertrophy goes, the one differentiating factor might be how much of a stretch they get you. So pay attention to that, and if for example you're more pressed for time, consider the incline dumbbell press as your primary option, given it's a bit more time efficient. Alternatively, if you want to turn this into a super time efficient but really effective session, stay tuned. I would recommend picking the incline dumbbell press or the incline smith machine press. Now that we've really effectively targeted at the upper pec, let's move on to the lower pec. To preferentially target the lower pec, I would do some sort of flat pressing variation. Perform three to five sets of 10 to 20 reps on the deficit push-up, the flat dumbbell press, or the flat smith machine press. Take the first set to about two reps in reserve and the last set all the way to failure. Rest for about 90 seconds between sets, given this is a compound movement. As far as which of these movements will give you the best stretch and potentially give you the most hypertrophy, that would be the deficit push-up. And doing it second after a heavier incline press allows you to be somewhat fatigued and potentially do this for a reasonable rep range of 10 to 20. However, if you can still get a great stretch with a flat dumbbell press or a flat smith machine press, those can be great options because you're moving from incline dumbbell press to flat dumbbell press or from incline smith machine press to flat smith machine press. You don't even need to change equipment to get a really robust training stimulus in. Now that we've trained both the upper chest and lower chest very effectively, let's move on to an exercise for our front delts. There are a few options here. The ones I recommend are the seated dumbbell overhead press, the seated Smith machine overhead press, or the machine seated overhead press. Perform these for two to four sets for 10 to 20 reps with 90 seconds of rest between sets, taking the first set to about two reps from failure and the last set all the way to failure. You'll notice all these exercises have you sitting down, removing some of the fatigue that could come from standing during overhead pressing. The seated dumbbell overhead press is all around great and can be a nice sequence moving from incline press to flat press to seated dumbbell overhead press, which means that you essentially don't need to move around the gym at all. It can be really time efficient. Likewise, the same goes for the Smith machine seated overhead press, if you've been doing the incline smith machine press and the flat smith machine press. Alternatively, if you just want a really quick plug and play option, the seated machine overhead press can be great as well. And here's a secret for you. The dip is also a pretty solid front delt exercise. By having your shoulder all the way behind you, getting your shoulder into deep extension, you're stretching out the front delt to a great extent. So if you want to do some dips, you can do some dips here as well. Next, we'll follow this up with the dumbbell fly to really finish off the chest. I told you this session would have a peck emphasis. Two to four sets of 20 to 30 reps to kind of finish out that repetition range variation. Because this is an isolation exercise, just 60 seconds of rest between sets will be sufficient. Take the first set to about two reps from failure and the last set all the way to failure. The dumbbell fly is maybe the most stretch heavy lift ever of any exercise I can think of. And additionally, if you were doing the incline dumbbell press and the flat dumbbell press, 
that the seated dumbbell overhead press, now you're doing dumbbell flies, you haven't had to move once. This is time efficiency, baby. Alternatively, if you're literally made of time and your grind set is negative and I don't relate to you whatsoever, you could do like a seated machine fly or a cable seated fly. Both of those are fine, but you know, you could be grinding instead with all that time you just saved or could have saved. Next, we'll move on to an exercise to hit the triceps. While some heads of the triceps get a decent stimulus from compound pressing movements, as evidenced by a Brandao study, you do want to include some isolation work to maximize hypertrophy, specifically for the long head of the triceps. Since the long head is biarticular, just doing compound pressing probably won't get us the best growth in that head. And so I recommend doing the dumbbell or cable overhead extension for three to five sets of 10 to 20 reps with about 60 seconds of rest between sets. Again, isolation movement. Take the first set to about two reps in reserve and the last set all the way to failure. This is your last tricep exercise for today, so you may as well go ahead. Why the dumbbell on the cable? Well, for one, the barbell overhead extension tends to be a little bit fucky with people's joints in my experience. You can try it, if it feels great for you, keep doing it. But in my experience as a coach, some people don't like it. The dumbbell is a great option for time efficiency. You can train both arms at once pretty easily. And it's a great sequence, yet again, you're going from dumbbell exercise to dumbbell exercise to dumbbell exercise. The cable is great too, but it can be a bit awkward to get into position if you're getting relatively heavy and doing it bilaterally. You could fix this by just doing it single arm. My main tip for this exercise is to use the cue, point the elbows at the ceiling. This will both increase the stretch on your long head of the triceps by keeping your shoulders in full flexion, but it will also prevent you from turning the movement into a strange behind the neck press, just so you can lift more weight and impress your bros. And finally, to finish off the session, we'll include a side delt exercise. You could put this on a pull day, you could put it on a push day, or you could just never do it. But if you're going to do it, I think you should do it on a push day because it's the easiest day and that's where it makes sense to include more stuff. I'd recommend doing the cable ladder raise for three to five sets of 10 to 20 reps. With around 60 seconds of rest between sets, taking the first set to two reps in reserve and the last set all the way to failure for your last exercise within this session. Compared to a dumbbell ladder raise, the cable allows you to get more of a stretch by having your arm come across your body. It also allows you to place more tension in that position by having the cable be orthogonal to a line of pull. Alternatively, you could do a machine lateral raise or a flat dumbbell side raise. You could literally do this whole push day with just a bench and some dumbbells. Start with the incline dumbbell press, move into the flat dumbbell press, move into the seated dumbbell overhead press, move into the dumbbell fly, then move into the dumbbell overhead extension. And finally, do a flat dumbbell side raise. And congratulations. Are you in a busy gym? You're that guy now. You're the guy everyone hates. You're using one bench for the whole session. But while the masses may hate you, you just saved so much time. And hey, if people want to work in, just tell them they can work in. Let's quickly go through a checklist and make sure this session is fire. First, we limited redundancy by including a variety of rep ranges, especially for the chest, which is the main emphasis in the session. We trained every muscle group that we're trying to train pretty effectively with at least one or two exercises per. We included maximally effective rep ranges on a variety of exercises, having some variation there, but focusing more so on the heavier rep ranges. This session can get you a comfortable 10 to 15 sets for your chest and five to 10 sets or so for most of your other muscle groups. We picked super effective exercises that also happened to sequence from one to the next very well. We used maximally effective rest times, slightly longer for compound movements, slightly shorter for isolation movements. We generally started with the chest walk, which is the emphasis for the session, but we also started with the more compound based movements, then moving into isolation movements. And finally, we used good technique on all exercises. That is the video, give this push day a try. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, subscribe, help me. Finally, turn the sign back on. It's been off for weeks now, and I need the money to be able to fix it. So please, like the video. Check my social bleed. We both know I'm not making bank over here, okay? In fact, if you'd like to help me make bank instead, check out myodap.com. It's a training app we've been working on for years that is essentially aiming to be like a coach in your pocket. MyAdapt also allows you to select which routine you'd like to follow and builds a completely individualized program based on that. You want to do push-pull legs? Guess what? MyAdapt can do that. You want to do a push-pull legs but training five days a week or four days a week, sort of asynchronously? It can do that too. It's smarter than I am, to be honest with you. It uses all of the most cutting-edge sports science to deliver the most effective hypertrophy programming you can find on the market today. Except not today, but in a few months when it comes out. But by signing up to the email newsletter there, you'll be notified when it gets released and you'll be able to sign up for a much lower price than anyone else. Alternatively, if you'd like me to coach you, check out the link above and I could become your coach. Anyways, have a fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Peace out from Wolf Coaching HQ. Bye.